Thank you. We will now restart proceedings and we will now proceed with the division on Amendment 18 and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. I have a point of order from Claire Hockey in the first instance. Thank you, President Officer. I was unable to connect and I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Hockey. Your vote will be recorded. I have a point of order from Graeme Day. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I had the same situation. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Day. Your vote will be recorded. I have a point of order online from Angus Robertson. Mr Robertson. Mr Robertson. Mr Robertson, I don't know if your microphone is on. Mr Robertson, uh, you would need to turn on your microphone. We cannot hear you. Mr Robertson, we cannot hear you, so I cannot uh, record your vote, obviously. Uh, I would say, which we are about to note, that in fact it would not make any difference to the outcome of the vote as a whole in any event. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 18 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes, 7, no, 104. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not, agree not agreed. I now call amendment 19 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 18. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. Ms Hamilton, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed.
Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 19 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 27, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 20 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 18. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. I think I have a point of order from Angela Constance. Upside in order, I was slow in connecting and I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Constance. Uh, your vote will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 20 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 27, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now turn to group two on rural support plan and evaluation and monitoring of schemes. I call amendment two in the name of Beatrice Wishart, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I call Beatrice Wishart to move Amendment 2 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I will speak to the amendment in my name. Uh, amendment 2 would require the Rural Support Plan to set out how the plan will be supported by an indicative multi-year financial framework. I listened to what the Cabinet Secretary said at Stage 2, that it's not possible for the Scottish Government to commit to including multi-year financial frameworks. I believe, however, that this does not prevent the Scottish Government from including an indicative version. This would provide the sector with information of the Scottish Government's intentions that would help inform farmers and crofters uh, in their planning and invest in their businesses and deliver on the objectives of, of the Bill. This is particularly relevant to the agriculture sector, which oper operates over longer timescales. I ask members to support Amendment 2, and I move the amendment in my name and I'll leave others to speak to their amendments in this group. Thank you, Ms Wishart. I call Ariane Burgess to speak to Amendment 21 and other amendments in the group. Ms Burgess. Thank you. I've, I have a number of amendments in this group to strengthen the Rural Support Plan because the plan is what will determine whether or not we meet the four objectives of this bill and wider objectives like net zero and reversing nature loss. Amendment 21 would require the Rural Support Plan to include targets to reduce agriculture's environmental impact in relation to biodiversity as well as indicators to measure progress towards these targets. This is a probing amendment to clarify government's intention regarding nature targets in legislation. If this bill does not include nature targets, where and when will they be added into law? We are living in a nature emergency. As the Scottish Government has recognised, Scotland is towards the bottom of the international league tables on biodiversity. This won't change unless we take steps to reduce the pressure we put upon nature and allow it to thrive. We need to work with nature, not against it. A flourishing natural world is not an optional extra. That can be considered if there, that can be considered if there is money left over in a budget. It underpins our human lives through ecosystem services like clean water, fertile soil, soil, pollination and a stable climate. And this will help agriculture as well. The Scottish Greens are clear that nature targets are essential, so I will listen with interest to the Minister's response 
to this. Amendment 22 gives ministers the power to describe how the support provided under the plan will help achieve several important outcomes for climate and nature, including reduced emissions, reduced nitrogen loss, increased land under organic management, improved animal welfare, and improved water quality. And I would encourage members to vote for this, and I trust that ministers will use this power to reassure us that all the plans will deliver for climate and nature. Amendment 24 simply gives ministers the powers to modify the list of information that may be included in a rural support plan, and this would be subject to parliamentary approval under the affirmative procedure. Amendment 25 pertains to the list of statutory duties that ministers must have regard to when preparing or amending a rural support plan. This, this list includes agriculture, biodiversity and the environment, but forestry is missing, despite the bill enabling ministers to provide support for forestry. This amendment corrects that omission and adds forestry to the list, in order that ministers must consider their duties related to forestry, including the duty to promote, promote sustainable forestry management when designing a rural support plan. Amendment 26 would require the Rural Support Plan to be externally evaluated by an independent body. It sets out the timings for when these evaluations must occur before and after each plan period, similar to the EU, with an exception for the first plan, which would be assessed halfway through. The Cabinet Secretary's amendments 9 and 12 require the ministers to monitor and report on the impacts of each support scheme, but it makes no commitment to monitoring being conducted by an independent body or consultant. Many stakeholders feel that there is not a good track record to date of monitoring and evaluation conducted by the Agricultural Directorate, and they strongly believe that an independent evaluation would provide a more objective, non-partisan view of how the plans and payment schemes deliver value for money and how well they progress us towards the Bill's objectives. Now, again, I will listen with interest to the Cabinet Secretary's response on this. I understand that the agriculture budget is already on the radar of Audit Scotland, given that there will soon be many new payment schemes with a large amount of public money. And I do recognise that it may be appropriate for the Scottish Government to conduct its own assessment first, which could inform any future scrutiny by Audit Scotland or another independent body. But I wanted to raise this for discussion because the Scottish Greens are clear that significant changes are needed in agriculture and land use, and we won't see that without significant changes to the support and incentives provided through the rural budget. We have not yet seen evidence of sufficient changes to the budget, so this does need to be discussed. Unfortunately, I cannot speak to all the amendments in this group because we are tight on time, but I will highlight Rhoda Grant's Amendment 10A to C, which the Scottish Government which the Scottish Greens strongly support. Currently, half of all farm support payments go to just 6.6 per cent of recipients, those uh, with the most land. Many of them have the most wealth already. This leaves very little for farmers, crofters and growers with less land. It incentivizes the continued consolidation of farm businesses, and it makes it very difficult for new entrants to break into the sector. The Scottish Greens would urge members to vote for Rhoda Grant's 10B to support a more equitable distribution of funds, and we also strongly support Ms. Grant's 10A on fair work and uh, 10C. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burgess. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Mary Goujon to speak to Amendment 8 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I just want to thank members across the Chamber for the constructive and really helpful discussions that we've had on these amendments and for their input into this as well. The amendments that I'll speak to, I believe, do balance the competing demands for detail as well as for flexibility. They reflect our route map transition period and the realities of being constrained by legacy EU CAP schemes while we continue to co-develop the detail of future support using the powers of this bill. And in doing so, it ensures that the rural support plan is proportionate, it will be robust and delivers both now and long into the future. So turning to my amendments first of all, Amendment 8 provides greater clarity on each plan period, addresses the calls for more information to assist with scrutiny and gives farmers, crofters and land managers more information on what to expect. It includes information on the expected total amount of support, the structure of support, allocation of support, the timetable for that support, as well as measures to benefit small producers, tenant farmers and crofters and any specific outcomes that Scottish ministers want to achieve. 
Amendment 11 addresses the issue of consultation through a new section on rural support plan engagement. It lists representative groups alongside specified organisations that Scottish ministers must consult with. A statement describing the con consultation undertaken must be laid before Parliament alongside any plan. Yes, I'm happy to. Richard Leonard. Secretary for taking an intervention. For the record, they are not listed, but would the Cabinet Secretary expect trade unions to be consulted on the rural support plan? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this hadn't been raised with me in discussion, but again, it's something I'm more than happy to consider going forward. Now, continuing on, the Amendment 11 and with what we've outlined in relation to that, it provides important clarity on the engagement and consultation that already takes place and will continue to take place, while not constraining our approach to co-development nor any statutory requirements as part of secondary legislation. Amendment 10 adds a new section on the scrutiny and reporting of plans and it sets out a series of requirements that a report must cover, including the total amount of support provided, a breakdown of that support, a description of any non-financial support, the distribution of support provided and an assessment of the effectiveness of the strategic priorities, deliv delivery of outcomes, progress towards objectives and the impact of any use of the Section 9 power to cap support and assistance. Reporting includes legacy cap schemes and it provides flexibility to prepare interim or other reports. The report must be laid before Parliament and published and this provides the clarity requested on reporting to assist ongoing scrutiny. Amendments 9 and 12 address monitoring and evaluation. Substantial amounts of public funding are given to farmers, crofters and land managers and it's only right that I think we seek a meaningful return on that investment of public money and that progress can be charted in delivering on the Bill's objectives, outcomes and statutory duties. They require the plan to set out how the impact of each support scheme will be monitored and it introduces a section on the monitoring and evaluation of schemes that requires Scottish ministers to report on the impact and effectiveness of each support scheme and of any other support provided out with a scheme. These reports must be laid before Parliament and published. And I think that this strikes a balance between setting the clear requirements, but with that flexibility to determine the appropriate timescale, method and publication to ensure a robust and evidence-led approach. Turning now to some of the other amendments that have been lodged in this group, firstly to Amendment 2 from Beatrice Wishart. Now, while I absolutely understand the rationale behind this amendment, I have set out the difficulties of providing detail on future budgets as we progress through each stage of this bill. To be clear, we have no guarantees from the UK Government as of next year. Prior allocations were made on an annual basis. We no longer have the assurance of multi-annual programme budgets as we had under EU CAP. It will be for the incoming UK Government to provide future funding guarantees, and I hope that Parliament supports me in pressing for urgent talks on the issue. In the absence of those funding guarantees, what Amendment 8 does is provide us with that flexibility to add that information in future should that situation change. And for those reasons, I'm unfortunately unable to support Amendment 2, and I would ask Beatrice Wisher not to press it. Now, in relation to Amendment 21, while I thank Ariane Burgess for bringing forward this amendment, I think we should be wary of requiring the establishment of targets where the legal effect may be unclear and the duty to achieve those is unqualified. The Scottish Biodiversity Strategy to 2045 sets out our clear vision for halting biodiversity loss, and this will be supported by a series of rolling delivery plans, which will include tangible actions for all sectors, including agriculture. I think it is really crucial that we take forward a bill that retains the flexibility to adapt to future challenges and opportunities without being tied to developing targets which may not necessarily help us tackle the biodiversity crisis in the right way. This bill already includes powers to support farmers and crofters to deliver on our biodiversity ambitions and the Rural Support Plan will enable future governments to set out how they are going to use that support to do so. So I would therefore ask Ariane Burgess not to press Amendment 21. In relation to Amendments 8a, b and c in this group, a plan can only ever provide an indication of at the point of time it is drafted, laid and published. The first version of the plan is going to be a living document and it's going to be iterative given the phase and the period of transition that we're in from legacy cap schemes into our new co-developed four-tier framework. In relation to amendments 8a and b, I've already discussed the lack of future funding guarantees from the UK Government from 2025. And in relation to amendment c, 
The time periods are subject to active co-development and require secondary legislation, subject to parliamentary timetables to enact any change. The plan is going to provide an indication of these dates, and the route map will be updated as and when more detail is known. I think that this is overall a sensible approach to take that balances the requirement for detail with the need for flexibility. And for those reasons, I'm unable to support those amendments. In relation to amendments 22 and 24, I think these amendments really helpfully balance the competing demands to provide greater detail with the need to retain flexibility during the phase transition, subject to parliamentary scrutiny. So I'm happy to support these amendments. And also now turning to amendments 23 and 11a, these provide no proportionality to the scale and type of any amendment, nor does it consider the existing role of Parliament and committees when scrutinising changes via secondary legislation and in committee evidence sessions. I think that this would add an additional, additional layer of bureaucracy and a resource demand which isn't proportionate nor normal practice. So I would ask that Parliament rejects these amendments. And turning now to Amendment 25 in this group. Yes, I'm happy to. Finlay Carson. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary. Give way. Uh, on, the, on the back of the comments you just said, would, does she not agree with uh, the Law Society that suggests, despite the need for flexibility in the approach, it needs to be balanced against clarity in the law, appropriate levels of parliamentary scrutiny, underpinning legislative and policy development and meaningful stakeholder consultation? because it's crucial to upholding the law, that the law is clear, comprehensible and transparent, so it can be easily understood by those affected. Are we not running the risk that, without a rural support plan at this stage, that farmers are not uh, clearer on how uh, the future legislation can impact them? Cabinet Secretary. I think I would disagree with that comment there because, as I've said, we are going through a period of transition at the moment. We have set out as much detail and when we're expecting to provide more information in terms of the route map. And as I set out to the committee and in responding to what the committee asked for, as well as the DPLR committee, I did publish a draft version of what that rural support plan might look like to give an indication to committee as to the type of information that that would contain, which, of course, is as much information as we can provide at this stage. Um, turning now to Amendment 25, at Stage 2, Ariane Burgess lodged an amendment requiring that for support to be available under the Bill, the creation of areas of woodland must have positive impacts on biodiversity, carbon and public amenity. I am grateful to Ariane Burgess for engaging constructively with me on this over the course of the last few weeks. Amendment 25 makes it clear that Scottish Ministers must have regard to statutory duties relating to forestry when preparing or amending the Rural Support Plan. And this will therefore include the duty to promote sustainable forestry management and I'm therefore happy to support this amendment. Turning to Amendment 10A, while I understand the sentiment behind this amendment, which is why at Stage 2 the matters that Ministers must have regard to when preparing or amending a plan were amended to include the desirability of the agricultural sector operating with fair work principles. The Stage 2 amendment covers how support has been obtained via the Rural Support Plan, and I would ask Rhoda Grant not to press her amendment. In relation to Amendments 10B and 10C, agree, uh, again, I would agree with the sentiment behind these amendments, and in Indeed, that's why at stage two we agreed to amendments that require the consideration of the benefits of a diverse and resilient agricultural sector, including small producers, tenant farmers, crofters and agricultural cooperative societies in preparing the plan. I've also lodged stage three amendments that require the plan to further set out any measures that are intended to benefit small producers, tenant farmers and crofters and ensure that reporting includes the distribution of support provided, including geographically and by sector. On the Section 9 use of powers to cap support and assistance, we made the use of this power subject to affirmative procedure at Stage 2, which provides Parliament with that scrutiny role. Amendment 10 on reporting includes an assessment of the impact of any use of Section 9 powers. And taken together, these amendments cover the distribution of support and scrutiny of any use of capping during reporting and monitoring and evaluation. And I think that these comprehensively address this issue. I therefore think that Rhoda Grant's amendments aren't necessary and would ask her not to press them. Turning to Amendments 10D and 10E, we need to ensure that we can do the right reporting at the right time to deliver the right output across a range of different types of support. So arbitrary requirements risk creating reports for the sake of reporting, which could then divert time and resource away from the co-development and delivery process without then providing any tangible or useful output. So I would ask Rachel Hamilton not to press an amendment, but if she does, I would ask Parliament not to support it. And turning lastly to Amendment 26, Amendment 26 replaces existing EU CAP evaluation requirements. 
Uh, these work in a CAP context are due to the long leading times and limited change within long programme periods. Our agricultural reform programme takes a different approach with continual co-development and reduced programming periods. I have lodged amendments covering the requirements of the plan, on the reporting of the plan and monitoring and evaluation, which I believe do better reflect our approach and the period of phase transition. So I, I hope that those provide assurance to Ariane Burgess that we will have a flexible but a robust approach to monitoring and evaluation. And I would therefore ask her not to press an amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 8A and other amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to my amendments in this group. I'd also like to thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for meeting myself and my colleagues to discuss the Government's intentions to introduce important safeguards into the Bill, as has been widely called for by stakeholders and colleagues. The Rural Support Plan is incredibly important and it sets out the strategic objectives and priorities, including how ministers will use the powers given to them to provide rural support for different purposes set out in the Bill. My amendments in this group seek to strengthen the Cabinet Secretary's amendment by providing further safeguards within the Minister's amendments. The Amendment 8, as lodged by the Cabinet Secretary, requires for further detail to be contained in the Rural Support Plan, including an overview of how support is to be provided for, how it, be, how it will be structured and how it will benefit producers. And that is something that we called for at Stage 2. And whilst I support this amendment, which aims to provide that additional clarity, I believe that it still fails to provide the necessary detail that would be key to be useful and beneficial to the Rural Support Plan. Amendment 8A, 8B and 8C are designed to strengthen the Cabinet Secretary's amendment by removing reference to indicators. These amendments therefore place requirements on the Government to provide commitments as to the total amount of support, how this scheme is to be divided between schemes and the duration of how long the schemes will last, which is in the same uh, vein as the amendment that I brought forward at Stage 2. In a similar uh, vein, Amendments 23 and 11a seek to improve the safeguards within this framework bill to ensure that the relevant committee has oversight and involvement in the co-design of the Rural Support Plan. So far, the Rural um, Affairs and Islands Committee has had very little, despite the Cabinet Secretary saying that she sent um, some detail recently around the Rural Support Plan. It really are just, they really are just place markers and no detail. And we have waited six years to get to this point um, of giving farmers detail. Um, Jeremy Moody um, from the Auctioneers and Valuers Association actually described the Rural Support Plan as the ghost within the Agricultural Bill. And so that is why it is so important. But as has been widely noted, framework bills lack the specified mechanisms for robust parliamentary scrutiny. Amendments 23 and 11a provide Parliament with an additional, additional level of scrutiny and oversight and development of the Rural Support Plan. Taken together, Amendment 10D and 10E introduce the requirement for ministers to prepare a yearly report on the amount of support provided during regular periods of a, a rural support plan. As link note in relation to their support of 10D, this, and I quote, strengthens scrutiny and ensures that agricultural policy can continue to develop based on evidence and experience. And I don't accept the Cabinet Secretary's description that this will take away um, from adapting uh, the, the policy objectives of this bill as we go along. Um, in addition uh, to my amendments, I would like to state my support for uh, Beatrice uh, Wishart's Amendment 2, which recognises the importance of an indicative multi-year financial framework on the effectiveness of the Rural Support Plan. We had much debate at Stage 2, um, and I engaged wholesomely uh, with the Cabinet Secretary around the points that I was making. Um, I don't accept that she uh, uses the, 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 the fact that uh, the UK government should come forward with a financial statement on funding because um, ring fence funding from this government, 46 million, was actually pulled. And so where is the clarity and transparency from, and the commitment from this government when they are asking for something from the UK government? And finally, um, 
presiding officer, um, I will be very happy to support Amendment uh, 25, which is in the name of Ariane Burgess, because I believe it is important to add forestry to, to that list. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. And I call Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 10A and other amendments in the group. Ms Grant. I thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to speak to my amendments 10A, 10B and 10C and the other amendments in the group. Um, this group is really the nub of the bill. The Rural Support Plan is really what this legislation is about. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's amendments and her taking into consideration the amendments proposed at Stage 2 by other members, including my colleague Colin Smith. I am also grateful that the Cabinet Secretary shared drafts and considered requests to add to her amendments. The amendments I am now proposing were not accepted by the Cabinet Secretary previously, but I hope I can persuade the Parliament to accept them today. 10A seeks to have fair work principles embedded in the Rural Support Plan. While I acknowledge that amendments regarding fair work practices have been added to the Bill at Stage 2. This adds these principles to the Rural Support Plan. It would mean support that would ensure a fair return for small farmers and crofters, and that larger enterprises receiving support would practice fair work principles for their workforce. Amendment 10b is about the outcomes the Scottish Government must report on at the end of a plan. My amendment asks that the report on the redistribution of support provided to ensure a more equitable distribution of these funds. The legislation allows for capping and redistribution of funds, and this amendment, along with 10C, simply means that the government report on and analyse how they used this power and the impact it had during the term of the plan. Beatrice Wishart's Amendment 2 asks for an indicative, an indicative budget for the length of the plan, and we support that. We accept that agricultural funding comes from the UK Government and therefore the Scottish Government is depending, dependent on having that budget to enable them to provide figures for the plan. Therefore, having indic indicative figures is useful if the Scottish Government themselves do not know what funding will be available for the lifetime of the plan. For the same reason, I can support uh, Rachel Hamilton's amendments. 8A, 8B and 8C, which would mean that the government would have to give a total amount of support to be delivered for the term of the plan. And that would be impossible if they don't have those figures themselves for the lifetime of the plan. Thank you, Ms Grant. And I call Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I just want to speak to a few amendments, if I may. Uh, before I do, though, I want to remind members of my register of interest that I'm a third generation farmer in Murray. Uh, and I've been farming for 40 years in part in, uh, in a family farming partnership. I farm 500 acres, which I own, 500 acres, which I rent, and 10 acres I rent under a 91 tenancy. I employ three people. I produce beef, barley and vegetables. And uh, I do receive uh, payments under the current scheme. I think that is about as full as frank as I can get, presiding officer. But turning to the questions uh, in thing, I'd like to say on Amendment 2, I think Beatrice Wishart's amendment is extremely useful. Uh, the PAC review and the previous reviews that we've had of the agricultural policy ended up with a complete change about where subsidies were paid. So it's very useful that we will have an indicative multi-year financial framework which should be able to, for, should be able, uh, to allow farmers to see where their money is going. Uh, I also like Amendment 8 from the uh, Cabinet Secretary about uh, uh, the overview of support, and I support the amendments in Rachel Hamilton's name, especially the ones in relation to Amendment 23 and 11A. I think that proves the importance of the committee system in this Parliament, which I think is really important. And we as a Parliament do disservice if we don't recognise the importance of the committee system. I don't support Amendment 22 in the name of Ariane Burgess because it appears that she wants to put in the face of the bill how farming should be carried out. And I don't think that's actually the role of politicians. I think that's the role of farmers responding to guides and nudges from politicians on what they want to achieve. Uh, I also support uh, the uh, uh, amendment 
11 in the name of Murray Goujon, which I think is really important uh, to support the engagement and the people that will be engaged as part of this process. It is something I pushed in amendments uh, at stage two, and I'm delighted to see that uh, she has embodied that in amendments at stage three. I don't always say such nice things about the Cabinet Secretary, but it's a pleasure to do so, and it's a pleasure to support Amendment 10. I'm not sure what Amendment 10b uh, would, would achieve because there is also uh, the ability within the bill to cap payments. So I'm not sure that Amendment 10b is, is, is of much help. And as far as Amendment 26 is concerned, I think that's already been covered. I think that's enough from me, uh, Presiding Officer, but just some thoughts on some of the amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mountain. And I now call on Beatrice Wishart to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment number 2. Mr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think the uh, number of um, uh, amendments from colleagues across the Chamber indicates just how uh, relevant the rural support plan is to this legislation. It's important to ensure that it's robust, that money is targeted. We know how schemes will be monitored. And at the same time, there's flexibility and co-design uh, co and development. Um, I, think, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her views on my amendment. I remain of the view that an indicative multi-year financial framework should be included in the Rural Support Plan, and so I move Amendment 2 in my name. Thank you, Ms Wishart. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. I have a point of order from Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. I was unable to vote. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Hockey. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 2 in the name of Beatrice Wishart is yes, 48, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 2. Ariane Burgess, to move or not move? Thank you. Not moved. Not moved. I now call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Uh, moved. Thank you. I now call Amendment 8A in the name of Rachel Hamilton, uh, already debated with Amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 8A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. I have a point of order from Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. The app froze and may I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Martin. Uh, your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 8A in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 27, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 8B in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 8B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. Uh, there will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. <coughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 8B in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 27, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 8C in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Uh, on the basis that uh, I don't think I'm going to win anything here, I'll not move. Not moved. I call on the Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 8. I press the amendment, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 22 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 2. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. The Parliament is not agreed. Uh, there will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 22 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes, 86, no, 28. Uh, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. 
moved. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 23 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 47, no, 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 2. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 2. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 11A in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 11A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. One here, so this one. Here. So, yeah. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Jenny Goruth. Uh, my app wouldn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Goruth. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 11A in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 45, no, 67. Uh, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call on the Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 11. Uh, press Amendment 11. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 10A in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 2. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 10A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. Uh, there will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 10A in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 28, no, 84. Uh, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 10B in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with amendment 2. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 10B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, uh, George Adam. Uh, the, the voting platform refused to work again, and I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Adam. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 10B in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 28, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 10C in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with amendment 2. Rhoda Grant, move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 10C be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 10C in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 54, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 10D in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 10D be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 10D in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 46, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I call amendment 10E in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 2. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 10E be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 10E in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 46, no, 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 10. I press Amendment 10. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 2. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Uh, given the Cabinet Secretary's comments on evaluation of the RSP, RSP I'm not going to move. Not moved. Thank you. We now turn to Group 3, Power to Provide Support. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, grouped with Amendments 27 and 29. And I call Rachel Hamilton to move Amendment 28 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I speak to my amendment, may I um, take this opportunity to thank the Parliament Bill team for their support throughout uh, the Bill. They have been incredibly um, thorough and efficient and uh, I really appreciate their time and I, I say that on behalf of me and my colleagues in Scottish Conservative Benches. Farmers and food producers de deserve clarity about funding to allow them to plan for the future. Farm plans often work in multi-year cycles. Amendment 28 requires that support is provided through a multi-year financial framework and, where appropriate, ring-fence funding. This amendment provides certainty and reassurance to farmers who want to plan and invest for their future. A commitment to multi-year funding has been consistently called for from farmers and producers, members across this chamber and key stakeholders. The NFUS note that, and I quote, without the inclusion of this amendment, there is a risk that agricultural businesses will be restricted to annual commitments which could result in a diminishing or reduced ability to deliver high quality agricultural produce as well as helping to tackle climate change and enhance biodiversity which are expected of them. By providing a multi-year annual financial framework this would represent a long-term commitment to Scottish farmers and food producers. Amendment 27 is a redrafted amendment from stage two following discussions with the Scottish Crofting Federation. This amendment enshrines into the bill that any future peatland restoration or agroforestry support schemes must be accessible to tenant farmers and crofters. This would help to remove barriers that tenant farmers and crofters often face when applying for support schemes. Before I consider how to vote on Amendment 29, I look forward to hearing Ariane Burgess' explanation um, and as to a spoiler, I do support engagement with stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. And I call on Ariane Burgess to speak to Amendment 29 and other amendments in the group. Ms Burgess. 
Thank you. With regard to power to provide support, my Amendment 29 would require ministers to engage with affected communities and consult with other appropriate persons before making regulations about supporting forestry projects. This was prompted by the Royal Society of Edinburgh's inquiry into the use of public funds to subsidise commercial conifer planting. They found that communities were confused and frustrated by poor and unclear engagement around forestry proposals for their area. The Cabinet Secretary has assured me that work is ongoing to improve guidance on multi-stage community engagement for each forestry project, but this bill creates an opportunity for government to set out consultation requirements for all projects that will receive public funding. Trust is low right now in the transparency and social responsibility of large-scale conifer projects. Just one example is the local campaign to oppose a large commercial Sitka spruce plantation in Stobo Hope to be used for carbon offsetting. The crowdfunder page says that the views of the local community appear to have been sidelined. While the Scottish Government has given over £2 million to a trust fund based in the tax haven of Guernsey, which bought the land for this project. I will listen with interest to the Cabinet Secretary's response and may not press this amendment, but I wanted to highlight the issue which is keenly felt by communities around the country. Coming on to Rachel Hamilton's amendments, 28 is about the multi-year financial framework which was discussed in the previous grouping, so I'll just briefly repeat that the Scottish Greens do not support making this a requirement as it would be impossible without more certainty from Westminster. We fully support the principle of Ms Hamilton's Amendment 28, which would ensure that all support provided for peatland restoration and agroforestry is available to tenant farmers and crofters. We do not want everyone to be able to join the effort to join the we do want everyone to join the effort on the ground to fight climate change. However, we are concerned that this amendment could be unworkable for some funding streams and could hold back money going to peatland restoration and agroforestry. The Land Reform Bill will improve tenants' ability to participate in and benefit from such activities, and the Scottish Government assures me that other work is underway to help improve landowner-tenant relationships, which would help achieve the same goal. Therefore, the Greens feel that this amendment is unnecessary and could be potentially counterproductive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Burgess. Um, as we are nearing the agreed time limit under Rule 9.8.4a small uh, c, I consider it necessary to allow the debate on this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. Thank you. I now call Fergus Ewing. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I rise to oppose Amendment 29, and the arguments I will, will adduce uh, apply um, mutatis mutandis, as the lawyers say, to Amendments 61 and 63, so I won't be repeating them later on to avoid detaining members unduly. Um, I am a great supporter, President Officer, of the four Fs, uh, which are, of course, farming, fishing, forestry, and field sports. They are a staple of the rural economy in Scotland, they must remain so, and we must all in our endeavours uh, uh, provide all support to them for the excellent, valuable, invaluable work that they do. Rewilding is often a preface to redundancy, and repeopling is what we should aim for. This amendment will cause significant, according to CONFOR, significant delay, administrative burden and cost. It is unnecessary, vague, it is damaging and it should not be on the face of a bill. The industry wishes to engage, they do engage, and they want to build, uh, Confor wants to build the, on the good relationship that it has with the government uh, to see how that can be improved. But this general duty imposed in this way, willy-nilly, lacking definition, lacking guidance, lacking any clarity, is open to abuse, and for that reason should be rejected. Uh, Sonny Officer, um, the other point I wanted to make is this, that the, the, there is a, an apparent um, ingrained antipathy amongst uh, the Green Party to commercial species, in particular Sitka spruce has already been named and shamed by the mover of the amendment. And I'm bound to ask, to, to paraphrase Monty Python, uh, or at least the Greens seem to be asking themselves, uh, uh, what has Sitka spruce done to us? Because Sitka spruce, although much maligned, is highly suited to the Scottish climate. It is, grows very effectively. It is inv invaluable for the commercial forestry sector, both panel products and sawmills. 
and indeed without a reliable continuous supply of Sitka spruce and other commercial species, then these industries, which contribute a billion pounds to the Scottish economy and support 26,000 jobs, mostly in rural Scotland, would be lost. Indeed, I know from when I was Cabinet Secretary that investments made by leading panel products companies were only made after rigorous examination that there would be sufficient supply of Sitka spruce in the future. Now, I regret that there has been a reduction of 41% in the financial support for forestry. Perhaps that was the, the influence of the Green Party in the now defunct cooperation agreement. Um, but now that that, uh, now that the presiding officer in conclusion, that Faustian pact has been ripped up as it deserved to be, I hope that in rejecting 29, 61 and 63, we can drive Mistopheles out of the room as well. I now call Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Always a dangerous thing requesting to speak after Mr Ewing has eloquently made the case for you. However, I would just point out that uh, it was some three, four years ago when Mr Ewing was in charge of forestry that we heard of the dire shortfalls that were going to be to our forestry sector. In fact, by 2036, there was no way they had enough timber in Scotland to keep the industry going. I'm therefore concerned that Amendment 29 will put on back burners the industry across the Highlands and across Scotland to produce timber which we can use in our houses. I'm further concerned that Amendment 29 will undermine the McKinnon Review and uh, the work that's being taken to try and speed up some forestry and the appropriate planting of appropriate trees in the appropriate place to make sure that our industry across Scotland is able to keep going without massive job losses. Therefore, I would ask the Chamber not to support Amendment 29. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In relation to Amendment 28, I want to be absolutely clear that I would love nothing more than to set a multi-year budget that, as we had with CAP when we were in the EU, provides us all, not least our farmers and crofters, with certainty. However, the UK Government has failed to meet its own promise to engage with devolved governments in meaningful discussion on the future of agriculture spending. And that means that we have absolutely no certainty after next year that there's going to be any funding at all in the future, which is completely unacceptable. So while that remains the case, I can't accept Amendment 28. Now, Amendment 27 is very similar to an amendment from Rachel Hamilton at Stage 2, and it seeks to make specific examples of support accessible to specific groups, uh, um, that being tenant farmers and crofters. And I would absolutely agree with the intent of the amendment that, that Rachel Hamilton has brought forward, because I am fully committed to ensuring that tenant farmers and our crofters are given a quality of opportunity to access the new agricultural support framework, and that the four tiers within it work for all types of land tenure. However, some of the barriers that we have to that currently happening, and particularly in relation to peatland restoration and agroforestry, relate to the landowner-tenant-farmer relationship and where the powers currently lie. That's why there are provisions in the Land Reform Scotland Bill, which I introduced to the Scottish Parliament in March, seek to remedy the barriers that we know tenant farmers face. On crofting, I'm absolutely delighted that the crofting law reform consultation was launched on the 6th of June and one of the proposals makes provision for crofter-led projects and landlord collaborations which will make it easier to initiate environmental projects on common grazing. However, Amendment 27 would be counterproductive in that support could only be provided to other persons, say agroforestry and arable systems, if that support was also made av available to tenant farmers and crofters, even if tenant farmers and crofters as a whole would not benefit from the type of support that was being provided. So I would therefore encourage Rachel Hamilton not to press her amendment. Ariane Burgess's Amendment 29 proposes to place a precondition on Scottish ministers to engage with any communities or persons that may be affected by forestry activities prior to making regulations under Section 4 of the Bill in relation to support for forestry. Now, while I can understand the rationale behind the amendment, I think that the burden that would be created by it would be unreasonable. As I mentioned at Stage 2, the forestry support that will be provided by this Bill extends far beyond woodland creation alone, and I'm concerned that the this amendment could result in an unreasonable duty being placed on Scottish ministers. 
Consultation and co-design will be at the heart of creating support for forestry, as was the case when creating the current forestry grant scheme. And I would also reassure Ariane Burgess that existing guidance relating to creating new woodland and forest planning already have robust engagement and consultation procedures built in. But further to that, both of these Scottish forestry guidance documents are currently being updated to bring them in line with the land rights and responsibilities statement too. So I hope that with that, that sufficiently demonstrates that engaging with state stakeholders and communities is already a part of the forestry processes and that this amendment is not required. Thank you. I now call uh, Rachel Hamilton uh, to wind up press withdraw amendment 28. Ms Hamilton. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, after uh, considering and listening to Ariane Burgess's amendment uh, 29, um, we will be supporting uh, that amendment um, because it has been requested uh, by farmers and crofters and communities across our constituency, not crofters in this particular example, um, around the Sitka spruce because that's absolutely impossible. But um, it has been something that the community have spoken um, thoroughly about. And the Royal Society of Edinburgh report, which Ariane Burgess refers to, was an important document uh, considering uh, some of the adverse, I would say, experiences that communities have had when their views were not heard and recognised. And I just ask the Chamber, how can swathes of Sitka spruce um, as Fergus Ewing has described, provide local jobs. I've spoken to people in communities um, who have seen uh, the, the livestock removed from the uplands and swathes of Sitka spruce brought in by investment companies um, who do not, in that, those particular circumstances, have the best interests of the communities at heart. And I do worry when we think about food security that we are taking away livestock and reducing those numbers. Yes, I will. I'm very grateful to give way. And I think we both support both farming and forestry. But read the jobs. I mean, the jobs in, in, in planting trees, in, in, uh, in the silviculture, in looking after them during their lifetime, in felling them, but then also the jobs in panel products, in sawmills, and the jobs in house building, where wood surely is a sustainable material that should be supplanting concrete and brick, uh, growing more of our own and relying less on imports. And Britain imports more wood per, per, as a proportion of the total consumption with ev than every other country in the world apart from China. Yeah, I, I thank um, Fergus Ewing for that intervention, and I completely understand uh, that you know, we need to ensure that we have provenance in the United Kingdom with regards to our supply chain in forestry. But I think from this, in the, the terms of this amendment, it doesn't take away the fact that having listened to communities and listened to people living in those areas, the jobs are not going to them. And I think if we can steer this wonderful industry in the supply chain uh, towards some of those um, employment opportunities, I think it would be another thing. But that is going off the topic here. It's not to say that I don't support forestry, and I was at a recent event sponsored by uh, Fergus Ewing here in the Chamber. I just don't want to see a monoculture landscape. So um, I'd also say to the Cabinet Secretary um, on uh, the, the amendment around the multi-year um, funding, would it be OK if I asked the Scottish Government for a spending commitment before the Scottish Government's budget announcement? Because the UK Parliament provided year-on-year -year funding across the lifetime of the Parliament with a BU uplift to support Scottish agriculture. That's what they said they were going to do, and they would not announce something before a spending review. But it, you know, it takes away when this Government use ring fence funding for something else, they defer the funding, 46 million disappears from the rural affairs budget, which supports agriculture, and they expect farmers to do the heavy lifting for their aspirations to meet net zero targets. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's important to point out here that I think the member is absolutely not comparing like with like in the different scenarios she's describing there. This parliament outlined exactly why those savings were made and why they were taken. The fact they were ring-fenced and must be spent on our rural communities because that's the very nature of ring fencing. That money will return to the portfolio as had been committed to by the finance secretary at that time and the, the first minister at that time too. These monies will be returned to the portfolio. However, compare that to the 
situation we're in with the UK Government. Funding is only confirmed and allocated on an annual basis. It is therefore impossible for me and would be completely irresponsible for me to commit to a multi-year financial framework when I do not have that certainty, I do not have that confirmation and I do not have that commitment from the UK Government. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for trying to justify um, their actions over deferring money, £46 million pounds worth of funding, which only £15 million pounds has been promised in 25-26. What certainty is that Absolutely. for farmers, presiding officer? They need to know Robin, that they can the support this government to meet those needs, net zero targets and provide food security for this country. And I do believe that farmers should be supported because they have faced significant global challenges over the last couple of years. Um, uh, presiding officer, that's all I have to say on this grouping. Thank you. And I move the amendment. My name. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 28 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 49, no 65, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 27 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Already debated with amendment 28. Rachel Hamilton, move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division. The members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Uh, I did vote, but I'm not sure if it's been recorded. I would have voted yes. Your vote has been recorded, Mr. Thank Martin. you. Thank you. And the result of the vote on amendment number 27 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 49, no 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I call amendment 29 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with amendment 28. Ariane Burgess, to move or not move? I, I listen to the Cabinet Secretary and accept her assurances on the guidance uh, being updated. Um, given the strength of feeling on consulting with communities, I trust that the forestry sector are listening to that too. In that light, I am not going to move the amendment. 
Okay, you withdraw the, the uh, Ali Amberger seeks to withdraw amendment. The amendment is not moved. Apologies. Okay, um, we now move to Group Four: distribution and capping of support and assistance. I call Amendment 30 in the name of Ali Amberger, grouped with Amendments 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and 36. Ali Amberger to move Amendment 30 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Ms. Burgess. This grouping consists of seven amendments about redistribution of the agricultural budget, and I know some of my colleagues in the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee proposed similar amendments to achieve the same intention at stage two, so I trust that there will be contributions to this debate on this crucial issue. The intention with all of these is to increase support for more people to make a good living from farming, crofting, growing, nature restoration and other good green jobs on the land. Not only will this help rural communities grow and thrive, but but it is also essential for tackling the climate and nature emergencies. And as I said earlier when uh, speaking to Rhoda Grant's Amendment 10B, half of all farm support payments currently go to just 6.6 per cent of recipients, those with the most land. Basic payments are known as income support, but many of those largest farms don't need income support. Richard Leonard made the point so clearly at stage two, the largest payments go to landowners like the Duke of Buccleuch, the Earl of Murray, the Duke of Roxburgh, and the Earl of Rosebery, who received between one and two million pounds in so-called income support in one year. This leaves too little for small-scale food producers for new entrants and for more targeted incentives to support climate and nature. My, amendment in this, my amendments in this group would uh, each ensure that public funds are better targeted to support more people carrying out activities in the public interest. Some could also help slow the continued consolidation of larger and larger holdings owned by fewer and fewer people, which is incentivized through the current area-based system. Section 9 of the bill gives... So, sorry, yes. Finley Finley Carson. Carson. Uh, on, on the point that uh, the largest owner, load, uh, the landowners are sometimes the biggest recipients of support, what evidence has the member got that these uh, recipients are not delivering a good value for money for the taxpayer in delivering climate change uh, adaptation? Uh, and given that, that we know that uh, some of Scotland's largest rural estates contribute significantly to the rural economy and to biodiversity and climate change mitigation. Ariane Burgess. I thank Finley Carson for that amendment. I think what I'm seeking to do with these amendments is actually create some distribution so that we support the smaller producers. Section 9 of the bill gives ministers the power to cap and or taper farm support payments. My amendment 31 changes this power to a duty. My amendment 32 restricts this duty to apply only to basic income support, while amendment 36 defines basic income support, basic income support which is likely to be tier 1 of the new framework. My amendments 33 and 34 would require ministers to use a front-loading mechanism to redistribute a relatively small portion of the agricultural budget. EU member states are now required to redistribute at least 10 per cent of their agricultural budget. In Ireland, recipients now receive a higher payment per hectare for their first 30 hectares. Amendment 33 sets the threshold at 30 hectares, while Amendment 34 leaves that open to the Scottish Government to determine. Amendment 35 would effectively create a minimum income floor as there is no real living wage in agriculture. I heard the Cabinet Secretary's concerns at stage two that this could result in payments to people who are not delivering the desired outcomes, but surely that is one of the issues with the payment system as it is now, while in the future payment framework we will have a more stringent conditions in order to qualify for support, as my amendment now alludes to. Finally, Amendment 30 uh, is a last resort if my other amendments fail. It would not place a duty on ministers or on the face of the bill to redistribute any of the budgets uh, or to ensure that farmers and crofters or to ensure that farms and crofters can make a living while delivering public goods, but it would require them to consider redistribution when designing support schemes and to report on any measures they plan to take to achieve this and the impact that will have on the distribution of payments. And I move Amendment 30. Thank you. I now call Richard Leonard. Sir, I rise in support of Ariane Burgess's amendments in this group. We have recently lost one of our greatest poets, novelists, thinkers with the sad death of John Burnside. And every time 
I hear the protesting cries of the Scottish Land and Estates lobby over the last few days, I can't help but think of him. Because not only did John Burnside call for a genuine redistribution of land and wealth and an end to subsidies to rich individuals and corporations, in one of his great memoirs he wrote, I had nothing against money, although I did feel it should be more evenly distributed. And any argument against doing exactly that struck me as specious, cowardly or self-serving. Moreover, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government has said to Parliament on a number of occasions where the money goes is a reflection of your values. So we need to decide whether we want to featherbed the biggest, the richest, the wealthiest or whether we want to level the payment system up. So I think that Ariane Burgess is right in moving these amendments, which are important for reasons of transparency, but I also think that John Burnside was right. We need a genuine redistribution. As Karl Marx said, it is not enough to interpret what's happening and where the money is going. The point is to change it. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, a number of these amendments reflect amendments that had previously been lodged at Stage 2, calling for capping, redistributive action and front-loading. In relation to Amendment 30, the actual detail of changes, including new schemes within the different tiers, will be provided for in secondary legislation using the proposed powers of this Bill. This is going to involve further consultation through the associated impact assessments along with parliamentary scrutiny. And as I've been clear, our approach is to always co-develop with our industry and wider partners to ensure that legislation and regulation is best fitted to work and deliver the outcomes. Now, I understand the sentiment of Amendment 30 and I can provide reassurance that any new schemes will be co-developed and any redistributive mechanisms will be implemented as required and in each case adapted to the needs of the recipients in question which may be much wider than provided for in this proposed section. Some support schemes, after all, might be focused on sustaining our rural communities rather than just agriculture. Amendment 30 is therefore inflexible and unnecessary, as the powers required are contained elsewhere in the Bill, and the appropriate checks and balances will form part of the rural support plan and the monitoring and evaluation of schemes. Amendment 31 would make capping and tapering mandatory. I think the intention from Amendment 32 is that this would only affect basic income support and a definition of basic income support is provided by Amendment 36. However, as previously outlined, decisions on capping need to be worked through as part of that co-design process in consultation with those persons that Scottish ministers consider appropriate to deliver exactly what is needed in each case. So I therefore urge Parliament not to support these amendments. Amendments 33, 34 and 35 seek to address matters that are related to our smaller producers. I have already made clear my commitment to ensuring that smaller producers continue to thrive and indeed we want to see more of them too. Capping and front-loading continue to be portrayed as a solution, but we also need to consider other, more nuanced approaches to support smaller producers, which is exactly what we're doing as part of the small producer pilot. Now, the, pi the powers in this bill provide us with the ability to think more creatively about supporting small producers. And it may be that after engaging with persons Scottish ministers consider appropriate, that capping and or front-loading is considered to be an appropriate approach. But I think to specify this in the bill would preempt that engagement and it goes against our commitment to co-development with the industry. I would therefore ask Parliament not to support Amendments 33, 34 and 35 to allow that co-development to take place. Thank you. I now invite Ariane Burgess to wind up. Uh, press the withdrawal Amendment 30. Ms Burgess. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary and uh, my colleague Richard Leonard uh, for their contributions and I have listened and I take on board many of the points raised. Uh, however, I still believe that these amendments are essential in order to create a fairer payment system and realise realize the objectives of the Bill, including thriving rural communities. None of these amendments would lock in area-based payments because capping, tapering, front-loading and a minimum income floor could apply regardless of the criteria to qualify for income support, but they would assure small producers that the Scottish Government is serious about supporting them. 
The Cabinet Secretary highlighted that her Amendment 10 requires the report on the Rural Support Plan to include the distribution of support provided, but that could only cover distribution between sectors or different geographical regions. It does not specify redistribution between larger and smaller farm sizes or amongst all recipients of support. So I believe my amendment adds value here. The Scottish Greens would urge members to vote for all the amendments in this grouping, and I press Amendment 30. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Are you sure, Mr Chowdhury, for point of order? Um, uh, I couldn't correct. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. Um, giving yourself a little more time to connect may help, but I will ensure that vote is recorded. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 30 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes, 50, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Ariane Burgess. I already debated with Amendment 30. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 31 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess is yes 26, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed to. I call amendment 32 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess. Already debated with amendment 30. Annie Ann Burgess to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now.
and the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 32 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess is yes, 25, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess. Already debated with Amendment 30. Uh, Annie Ann Burgess, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 33 in the name of Anne Ann Burgess is yes, 26, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Call Amendment 34 in the name of Anne Ann Burgess. Already debated with Amendment 30. Anne Ann Burgess to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 34 in the name of Anne Ann Burgess is yes, 26, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment uh, 35 in the name of Anne Ann Burgess. Already group, uh, debated with Amendment 30. Anne Ann Burgess to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division. The members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed.
Shirley Amsamovo, point of order. Thank you, President Officer. I, my app wouldn't collect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr. Mulwell. I'll ensure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 35 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 26, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 36 in the name of Ariane Burgess. Already debated with amendment 30, Ariane Burgess to move or not move? The question is that amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment 36 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 26, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We move now to Group 5, Refusal or Recovery of Support, where in the public interest. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Ariane Burgess, Group with Amendments 38, 39 and 40. Ariane Burgess to move Amendment 37 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Ms Burgess. Thank you. I'll, I'll, be, I'll try to be brief with my amendments in this group as I believe they are quite self-explanatory. Amendment 37 would give ministers the power to refuse support if, uh, if that would not align with the objectives of agricultural policy set out in this bill. That could either be because of intended activity or because of the recipient, for instance, if the recipient has previously engaged in tax evasion. The bill already includes a power for ministers to refuse support if they consider it would not be in the public interest, but the public interest is quite a flexible concept. So this amendment would add some clarity by linking back to the objectives and the minister could use this if they wish. Amendment 38 continues with the same principle, but it specifies that support could be refused if it would support land management for driven grouse shooting where that is the primary activity of the landowner on that land. I believe it is important to provide an explicit power for this because managing land for driven grouse shooting is so clearly at odds with the objectives in this bill. Burning large swaths of, swathes of heather and killing wild animals that compete with grouse or pheasants is clearly in a direction, direct opposition to the objective on climate mitigation, adaptation and nature restoration. And maintaining large areas of land has no, as no-go areas for local communities does not promote thriving rural communities. Amendment 39 gives ministers the power to refuse support to or recover support from any person found guilty of a wildlife crime or who had a license revoked under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, Section 16 AA. That section was introduced through the recent Wildlife Management and Nurburn Bill and establishes a licensing scheme for killing or taking certain birds in limited circumstances. If a person knowingly abuses such a license, they should not be eligible for public support, and this would grant ministers the power to refuse that. Thank you. I now call Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment uh, 40 and the other amendments in the group. Mr. Mountain. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'm going to start with the positive one, which is Amendment 40. And the reason why I put this amendment in is that where uh, grants has been or subsidy has been reclaimed, 
I think it entirely right and equitable that the person who has had their grant or subsidy reclaimed can appeal to the Scottish ministers so they can appeal the decision. And it is then up to the uh, Scottish ministers to either hear that appeal or, and dismiss it or to even review it, which is the whole point of the amendment. It seems perfectly equitable to me that if a decision is made that there should be a right of appeal. Uh, turning to the other amendments in the group, um, uh, Amendment 37 is, is quite subjective and not very objective in, in the way it comes across. And therefore, because of that subjectivity, I, I'm afraid I can't support it and I would urge the Chamber not to support it. Amendment 38, I totally accept Ariane Burgess's dislike of grass shooting, but grass shooting still happens to be a legal activity in Scotland. Therefore, to say that because the primary activity, and I want to dwell into, that, uh, into what primary means, is grass shooting, that they shouldn't be able to get sub subsidy. I think that's wrong. But Ariane Burgess has failed to define what primary activity is. How do you define primary activity? Is it the amount of people that are employed? Is it the income that comes in? Is it the expenditure that goes out? Is it based on the number of sheep and cattle on the holding, or is it based on the number of grass? It is too vague. Uh, and, I, and I think if the member had really meant to do this, she would have been a lot clearer in what she meant. But she, because she's not clear, and because grass shooting remains legal in Scotland, I think this would be entirely wrong. Because Grouse shooting can improve the habitats on the hills, especially where moorland management is carried out in a way to protect and manage all species, not just one species. So I think that's wrong. As far as Amendment 39 is concerned, I believe the Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, has incredible powers when it comes to cross-compliance anyway. And if members uh, or if farmers are claiming or landowners are claiming subsidy and they clearly failed to abide by the conditions of cross-compliance, the Cabinet Secretary can stop their grant anyway. That is the whole point of it. So I think Amendment 39, although well-meaning, is not required. And I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's answer on, on these questions. But I hope that Amendment 40 is something that she thinks is, is fair and in line with natural justice. Uh, thank you, President Williams. Thank you, and I call Richard Leonard. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I rise to support Amendment 37 in the name of Ariane Burgess because it is my considered view that alignment and consistency here are extremely important. Let me share with Parliament an example. I recently corresponded with the Cabinet Secretary on the strange case of a major financial institution receiving major amounts of public money to plant trees in the Cairngorms National Park, while at the same time ramping up its investments in North American oil, gas and coal shares. According to the ferret, in 2023, Aberdeen increased its shareholdings in 33 coal, oil and gas firms in the USA by a value of £234 million. In August of 2023, it received a £2.5 million grant of public money under the Forestry Grant Scheme for tree planting on the Far Raleigh Estate and peatland restoration. When I challenged this, the Cabinet Secretary explained in a letter to me, Scottish forestry does not restrict funding to companies based on their wider business interests. Well, I think Scottish forestry should look at wider business interests and activity. We need to take on corporate hypocrisy and big money greenwashing so I believe this amendment takes us in the right direction. Thank you. I now call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In, in terms of Amendment 37, objectives are overarching principles which are supported by the powers of the Bill, and all support is co-developed to support these objectives. Schemes will only be developed which contribute to the objectives, and the aim of this section is in relation to instances where a support payment should be refused or recovered. So Amendment 37 is therefore not required. Turning to Amendment 38, there are numerous landowners who undertake grouse shooting 
alongside activities that we, we may want to support that deliver outcomes of our vision for agriculture, namely producing high quality food, climate mitigation and adaptation and nature restoration. And I think a good example to highlight this would be peatland restoration, because there are some really important peatland restoration uh, sites on land that is also being used for grouse shooting. So to preclude them from receiving support could have longer term unforeseen consequences. While I understand the sentiment of Amendment 39, this amendment is unnecessary for the purpose of withholding or recovering support. Inclusion of any specific circumstances where support might be refused or recovered may infer that other convictions not included in the bill would not result in the refusal of payment. So I think that that could add some confusion. So therefore, for the reasons I've set out, I would ask Parliament not to support Amendments 37, 38 and 39. Amendment 40 enables Scottish Minister to make provisions by regulations about the manner and circumstances in which a person who has had support refused or recovered under Section 10 may have the Scottish Ministers review their decision or to appeal that decision. The Scottish Public Finance Manual describes the duty of best value in public services, which extends to the provision of support, which is the purpose of this power. However, it is equally important that there is transparency, and I agree it would be reasonable that there is an appeal process to ensure appropriate application of this power, and I am therefore happy to support Amendment 40. I'm just closing. Okay, I now call Ariane Burgess to wind up press or withdraw Amendment 37. Ms Burgess. Uh, thank you, and I, I appreciate uh, the Minister's comments and, and also uh, comments from my uh, colleague Richard Leonard with a, a good example of why it's important to um, uh, look at not providing, providing support if activity doesn't align with objectives. Um, on uh, Amendment 38, uh, I, I listen with interest around the uh, matter that in some situations the same moors for uh, the same estates that have uh, grass moors also um, do peatland restoration and provide some jobs, but not nearly as many as would be created through nature-based businesses or where possible food production on land. Fundamentally, though, the Greens are clear that the real main point is that public money should not be channelled into blood sports. I'll leave it there and I encourage all members to ensure that public funds are used for public good by voting for my amendments 37, 38 and 39. I press amendment 37. Thank you. The question is that amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Graham Day. Apologies, President Officer, I couldn't connect to the app. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Day. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order. I can confirm, Mr Mara, that your vote was recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 37 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess is yes 26, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Uh, I call amendment 38 in the name of Annie Ann Burgess. Already debated with amendment 37. Annie Ann Burgess, then move or not move? Moved. 
Question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Graham Day. Again, presiding officer, I couldn't connect. I'd have voted no. Thank you, Mr Day. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 38 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 25, no 84. There were no abstentions. The uh, amendment is therefore not agreed to. Call Amendment 39 in the name of Ariane Burgess. Already debated with Amendment 37. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division. A member should cast the votes now. Okay, members will note that we are uh, shortly reaching the next time limit as a consequence under Rule 9.8.5a. I am minded to accept a motion without notice uh, to propose that the time limit be extended by 30 minutes. And I invite Jamie Hepburn to move such a motion. Yes. Move, President Officer. <laughs> Thank you. The question is that the time limit for the debate on amendments be extended by 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Parliament has agreed. Thank you. And the uh, vote on Amendment 39 is now closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 39 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes 26, no 87. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 40 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 37. Sir Mountain, to move or not move? Moved, Presiding Officer. Question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. We are not agreed. There will be division, and therefore uh, members should cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 40 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 104, no, 7. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And we now move on to group 6, eligibility for assessment of monitoring, etc. of and information about support. I call amendment 41 in the name of Ariane Burgess group with amendments 42, 43, 46, 48 and 49. Ariane Burgess to move amendment 41 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Ms Burgess. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. My amendments in this group aim to ensure that small producers have a route to receiving direct payments from the core agricultural budget, not only separate support schemes which may be time-limited and less secure. Currently, farmers, crofters and growers on less than three hectares of land are ineligible for basic payments, but it is the smaller farms and market gardens that tend to produce the most food per hectare and to use nature-friendly farming methods not to mention contributing to thriving local communities. They should be supported. I discussed Amendment 41 at Stage 2, and I'm bringing it back to highlight the principle again. It would be ideal if regulations allowed applicants the choice of being assessed for, assessed for support either on the basis of land area or on the basis of productive agricultural activity. However, I've reflected on points made in meetings with the Cabinet Secretary, who has suggested two alternative amendments to achieve this intention, so I will not press uh, 41. My Amendment 43 allows Ministers to vary the minimum amount of land that is required to be <coughs> eligible for support for different types of farming. That means that for local veg growers, they could potentially qualify for support even if they have less than three hectares. My Amendment 42 enables Ministers to make provision for making support dependent on meeting a certain turnover threshold rather than owning a certain amount of land. And this is a solution that stakeholders brought to my attention and which I suggested to the Scottish Government many months ago. So I am very pleased to be able to move that, uh, that amendment today with the Government's support. My Amendment 46 would ensure that those receiving rural support payments would need to act in accordance with land reform and land access aims as set out in the Land Rights Responsibilities Statement. These principles include contributing to public interest and well-being and balancing public and private interests. If the government believes that explicitly mentioning the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement is not necessary, I will be interested to hear their arguments on that. And the Scottish Greens oppose Edward Mountain's Amendment 48, which would restrict the level of penalty that is due for overclaiming support. Overclaims could be very large sums, particularly when submitted by large landowners. Restricting the penalty to just 10 per cent of the overclaim could make for a disproportionately low penalty, even if the recipients first overclaim, uh, first overclaim and particularly if the overclaim support does not have to be paid back. And I'd like to say that we also strongly support Richard Leonard's Amendment 49. Uh, thank you, Ms Burgess. I now call uh, Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment 48 and other amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I am actually just going to speak to my amendment rather, rather than the other amendments in the group, because I think it's important, this, uh, this particular amendment. Now, in a previous life, I used to have to fill in numerous uh, amounts of single farm payment uh, sheets. Uh, I think the worst one year was 15. It was probably the most traumatizing period of my life. Uh, and if it didn't cause me to have gray hairs just looking at them, it did by the time I got to the end of them. And that was the reasons are that the complexities of it are such that it is very easy to make a mistake. Unintentional mistake. There was, there was no obviously aim to be dishonest, but it is easy to make a mistake. Um, for example, one could argue that if you have the grazing on the foreshore, that for at least 12 hours of the day, you have the grazing right the way down to the low water mark. Um, but it could be argued that on the high tide, that you only have it to the high tide mark for 12 hours. And somewhere in between, there's a fair limit of where you can get. Now, if you tried to claim for that, if you tried to claim for that reasonably and you made a mistake, under the old system, you could lose your entire claim. And that was one of the major problems that farmers had, is that they genuinely made a mistake 
and they genuinely got absolutely hammered by the European Union, who demanded huge quantities of money back. Now, my amendment is just to say, in the first instance, if you genuinely make a mistake, that you should obviously pay back the entire money that you've made a mistake in claiming, and but the fine on top of that should be limited to 10%. If, after that, you make another error on another year, then you, you lose that uh, as a proviso. Uh, I think it's a genuine way to make farmers not spend half the night uh, filling in their forms, as I used to do in the past. And, and I'm sure that all those people involved in agriculture would have heard uh, farmers say, if we make a genuine mistake, treat it as a genuine mistake, yes, we've made a mistake and we'll accept it. But, uh, yes, I will take an intervention. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Edward Mountain, for taking the intervention. Very often I get casework from farmers who are, uh, uh, you're describing who have made a very simple error in calculation. It could be something to do with GPS, um, whatever, in terms of the area. Um, and, actually, that penalty costs them dearly because it is their livelihood. And it's really important that we recognise that, as you're trying to describe, and you, as you are describing very well, that farmers are genuinely um, sometimes make mistakes, as we all do here. And I think that this amendment uh, very well recognises that. Ed Romain. Um, and, and I agree with the member there. I, I mean, honestly, if somebody's been dishonest and dishonest, dishonestly claimed money, then I would agree with Ariane Burgess that they should lose all their subsidy as far as I'm concerned. But if they've done it as a, as a matter of mistake, I don't think they should be fined for it. And I, I don't accept Ariane Burgess's argument, you know, where she said that big landowners who, who make a big claim will get away with more. No, they're paying all the money back and they're getting a 10% uh, fine. So if their subsidy was that they misclaimed, for example, was £50,000. You can do the maths. They'd have to pay £50,000 back and a £5,000 fine. That's quite draconian uh, when probably subsidies make up 18 to 20 per cent of, of farmers' income. So I would urge the Chamber to consider it. Uh, it is not anything more than a way of trying to make the long nights of filling in your claim forms uh, anything but easier, knowing that if you genuinely make a mistake, by, say, a small area of declaration, you're not going to lose all of your subsidy. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I now call Richard Leonard to uh, speak to Amendment 49. Are there amendments in the group? Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin at the very outset by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for her very constructive approach to this amendment and this area. It's an amendment designed to promote openness and transparency regarding the ownership and control of the business or the farm in receipt of public funds under the farm payment system. We are, after all, talking about half a billion pounds and more of public funds in any one year, so this is a matter of public interest. The level of transparency provided by this amendment helps prevent the misuse of UK corporate structures. It improves the prevention of economic crimes like fraud, money laundering and tax evasion, and it is good audit practice. Since 2016, people with significant control have to be registered with Companies House. Since 2022, a register of overseas entities has to be declared with Companies House as well. And since April 2022, under the Scottish Government's land register, there is a requirement that a controlling interest in Scotland's land has to be declared uh, and uh, this, this is a register which is maintained by the Registers of Scotland. Yes, of course. Finlay Carson. I very much appreciate Richard Leonard going away. I just, uh, during the, the time that the committee took evidence, there was no suggestion that there was any fraud on a large scale, uh, oh, well, on the large scale. Um, so can you point to, to any examples of where agricultural support payments have been fraudulently claimed to, to the level that uh, you, you, you might be suggesting? Richard Leonard. Uh, no, I'm suggesting a preventative strategy, which is that um, openness will drive out the possibility of there being any such uh, crimes committed. So um, I'm really just uh, pointing out to standards which are mainstream uh, and which actually have been introduced uh, under the auspices of a Conservative government to try to prevent money laundering in all sorts of spheres of the economy. 
But uh, the point of this amendment uh, is to uh, publish more information, including uh, the ultimate owner and controller uh, of uh, the business or farming receipt uh, of monies. Uh, there would be very limited administrative burdens on those required to make the disclosure, precisely because the disclosure is already made to Companies House uh, and to the Registers of Scotland. Uh, I mentioned in the debate at stage one, as an example, of the two largest recipients of farm payments in 2022 being £1.8 million for Queensbury Farming Limited and £1.7 million for Bowhill Farming Limited, both owned by the Duke of Buccleuch. But you would not know that from the published data, so this amendment seeks to close that gap. Perhaps we should not be surprised to learn that Scottish land and estates do not support this amendment, but unusually for them, they are very shy about telling us the reasons why. This information should be openly available, it should be transparent, it shouldn't be subject to freedom of information requests or journalistic <laughs> digging. Passing this amendment would herald an important breakthrough on the road to making the agricultural payment system more transparent, more accountable and more open, allowing us in Parliament, but also the people, to see who ultimately makes decisions and who ultimately benefits from these payments of public money. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As highlighted at stage two, if Amendment 41 were accepted, it would create a situation where recipients could choose to have support based on either land area or productive activity. And from a practical standpoint, this would result in a complex and, in my view, unworkable administrative process. So I would ask a Parliament not to support this amendment. In relation to Amendments 42 and 43, I think that the changes that have been proposed by Ariane Burgess in Amendment 42 and 43 are helpful. They help clarify the scope of the powers in sections 13 and 14 of the bill and I'm happy to support those. In relation to Amendment 46, I want to thank Ariane Burgess for bringing forward this amendment because it highlights the importance of our land rights and responsibilities statement under the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016. Now, the principles in the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement apply to everyone that has rights and responsibilities in relation to land, including those who will receive support under our future financial framework. Compliance with the principles is voluntary. Now, ministers must promote the principles as set out in the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, and this duty applies to them when using any of the powers under the Bill. And where appropriate, ministers would, for example, require to have regard to the principles when providing for conditions for support under under section 6 of the bill. However, the land rights and responsibilities principles are high level and they're policy focused. They aren't designed to apply to everyone and in particular, they do not set out conditions that could properly be applied to every person who receives support under the bill as is proposed by this amendment. So, although this amendment is well intentioned, it is not needed and it doesn't work. And it's because of that I would ask Ariane Burgess not to press it. In relation now to Amendment 48, I understand that Edward Mountain is keen to ensure that farmers and crofters are not hit by a disproportionate penalty for a first mistake. It is important that penalties are proportionate. We've already used our powers under the Agriculture Retained EU Law and Data Scotland Act 2020 to simplify and improve penalty rules. However, Amendment 48 risks making penalties less proportionate. Now, it may mean that ministers would be unable to provide for a penalty that would have the right dissuasive effect, and in particular, it would prevent appropriate penalties being applied should public funds have been fraudulently claimed. Now, this bill is a framework bill and needs to be capable of being exercised flexibly over the long term, and future administrative penalties should be fully considered with farmers, crofters and other stakeholders as part of the process that we've committed to of co-design. Uh, yes, I will. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you. And, and, and I hear what the uh, Cabinet Secretary says on that particular point. Given the fact that some of this will be carried forward in regulation, will she undertake to discuss those regulations to ensure the proportionality of, fi of fines meets the crimes? Because it may help me not to move that, the amendment. 
Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. As I hope I've just outlined in my comments, that's very much part of our process of co-design. Uh, we want to discuss this with farmers and crofters as we go forward and we bring forward any re uh, regulations in relation to that. Uh, on Amendment 49, I absolutely agree with Richard Leonard that ministers should be able to make regulations that provide for the publication of information about persons who own or control the recipient of support. So that's why I'm happy to support this amendment and I really want to thank him for working constructively with me on this following stage two. All of us, I'm sure, are supportive of making clear the ability of Scottish ministers to report upon the end destination of future public support for agriculture. But we will, of course, work with stakeholders to co-design any regulations we make under this power. And we will, of course, consult the information commissioner too. Thank you. And I call Ariane Burgess to wind up and press or withdraw <laughs> Amendment 41. Thank you. Uh, many large, larger farms are employing sustainable and regenerative methods and contributing to local economies, and these amendments are not intended to ignore or diminish those benefits, but I would like to reiterate the importance of giving secure support to small-scale farmers, crofters and growers. Many peer-reviewed publications assert that smaller farms tend to produce higher yields and more biodiversity per hectare, and they also tend to provide more jobs per hectare as they use less mechanisation than many larger farms. Further, small producers usually value the local distribution of their food above the production of commodities for export. They are also de deserving of support. So the Greens encourage members to support my amendments 42 and 43. I will not press Amendment 41, which has the same aim. And I've heard what the Cabinet Secretary said about my Amendment 46, and I will not move it, as I trust that other mechanisms will ensure that landowners abide by the land rights and responsibility statement. And with that, I withdraw Amendment 41. Thank you. Ariane Burgess seeks to withdraw amendment number 41. Does any member object? No member objects and amendment 41 is withdrawn. I call amendment 42 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with amendment 41. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. Vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 42 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes, 88, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 41. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. I call Bill Kidd for a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I devoted yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kidd. We'll ensure your vote is recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 43 in the name of Ariane Burgess is yes, 88, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And we move to group seven, fair work, temporary migrant workers and workers' accommodation. I call amendment 44 in the name of Ariane Burgess, grouped with amendments 45, 47, 53 and 56. Ariane Burgess to move amendment 44 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group are all concerned with safeguarding vulnerable seasonal work workers on farms. The Scottish Government has recognised the problems with the seasonal worker visa that was created by the UK Government to help mitigate the shortage of workers due to Brexit. Unfortunately, Scotland cannot change the seasonal worker scheme as migration is reserved. But my amendments in this group offer a way to mitigate some of the harms. Amendment 53 places a duty on ministers to publish a register of farms that employ temporary migrant workers and have put certain measures in place to protect them. If such a register existed, seasonal workers could look upon a prospective employer and then make an informed decision about whether or not to enter into an employment contract with them. This is particularly important in the case of seasonal workers because their contracts are linked to the their accommodation and to their visa. So if something goes wrong in their job, they are disincentivized to speak out for fear of losing their place to stay or even having to leave the country. In the housing sector, letting agents must provide certain information to join the Scottish Letting Agents Register so the government can ensure that they are fit and proper persons to let accommodation. The register and related powers also enable ministers to seek information to monitor compliance and conduct inspections. And this is just what is needed to provide vulnerable, uh, to protect vulnerable seasonal workers. My Amendment 45 would allow ministers to include fair work principles within the eligibility criteria for support for persons that employ temporary migrant workers. Amendment 40, 44 is similar, but it adds inclusion on the employer register as a potential criteria for support. It also sets out three fair work considerations the wages paid to the worker, the availability of channel, channels for workers' representation, like unions, and any history of tax avoidance by the employer. These considerations mirror those set out in the Fair Work Guidance for Public Sector Grants. The Scottish Greens consider that any employer who receives public funds should offer fair work conditions, so we would urge members to support Amendments 53, 45, 44 and 47, which simply defines temporary migrant worker drawing on definitions in relevant legislation. Turning to Richard Leonard's Amendment 56, it would enable agricultural officers to make inspections of accommodation provided for seasonal workers to ensure it is fit for human habitation. And I have also been raising this issue with the Scottish Government for several months. Last year, the Workers, Supporters, the workers Support Centre supported 63 farm workers on housing issues, including holes in caravans, damp, black mould, rodent infestations, broken toilets and windows that wouldn't open. And I'm very grateful that Mr Leonard has persevered and that the government is supporting this amendment and I encourage other members to do the same. And I move Amendment 44. Thank you. I call Richard Leonard to speak to Amendment 56 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I remind members of my voluntary register of trade union interests? The Scottish Agricultural Wages Board sets the minimum rates of pay and other conditions of service for agricultural workers in Scotland. This includes a daily accommodation offset for workers for accommodation other than a house. In 2024, this increased by 9% to £9.99 per day, which is directly deducted from wages. The Scottish Government estimates that there are between 6,000 and 7,000 seasonal workers in Scotland in any one year. They invariably have this direct deduction from their wages taken. So when the Cabinet Secretary tells us at stage two that she does not want to, I quote, 
bring housing matters into the bill, it's too late. They are already there. They are a fundamental part of the fabric of our rural communities, of agricultural life in Scotland, and of employment contractual relations, especially on farms where accommodation is tied to employment. We receive report after report with irrefutable evidence of migrant seasonal workers brought over by labour providers on six-month visas under the seasonal workers' visa scheme, not living but barely existing in porter cabins or static caravans on farms which are not insulated, which are damp and covered in mould, which have security, personal safety issues, infested with rodents, where there are no laundry facilities, where unsanitary conditions are all too common, and we hear of examples of shared facilities in situations where as many as 30 people are sharing the one facility. All of these findings have been unearthed by the authoritative Worker Support Centre. And that is why I've tabled this amendment, to set some standards of decency and dignity that seasonal workers should have satisfactory facilities for the washing and cleaning of laundry, that water, heating and power should be included in that accommodation charge, not charged extra. And it is my simple contention that as the Agricultural Wages Board is responsible for setting the daily rate for temporary accommodation, it should be ensuring that this accommodation is fit for human habitation. Why do I continue to press this? Well, in a letter to me last week, the Cabinet Secretary revealed that not one farm, not one business with seasonal workers has been selected for a control test inspection by the Agricultural Wages Enforcement Team in the last five years. Anywhere in Scotland, not one. And even if there had been, the Cabinet Secretary informs me, the standard of accommodation is not part of the routine questioning and it is not covered by the Agric Agricultural Wages Scotland order. But of course, the daily accommodation offset is covered by the Agricultural Wages Scotland order. That letter last week, written in the Cabinet Secretary's own words, makes the case for Amendment 56 far better than I ever could. There is a huge gap in regulation, in enforcement, and so in protection here. And it's worse, because at stage two, the Cabinet Secretary spoke of local authority duties in this area. But the problem with that is, currently the tolerable standards set out in the Housing Scotland Act 1987 does not apply to accommodation for seasonal workers. It's true, the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act 1960 makes provision for the oversight of caravans, and it's also true that local authorities license and inspect sites under that Act, but seasonal agricultural accommodation is excluded. Finally, we are told that we have to wait for Housing 2040, to wait for a future cross-tenure housing standard bill to address these severe deficiencies. But in that same letter, the Cabinet Secretary was forced to admit that we will have to wait until 2025 before even the consultation on this will start. And if past consultations are anything to go by, it will not reach the statute book in this session of Parliament. So to members of Parliament, I say, what about the workers arriving in Scotland in the coming weeks for the fruit harvest? What about the workers arriving in Scotland in the coming months for vegetable and crop harvesting? What happens next week? What is the Cabinet Secretary going to do about that? Will she tell Parliament today? Don't we owe these migrant workers the responsibility to act now? Justice delayed is justice denied. Let's get on with it. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Turning firstly to amendments 44, 45, 47 and 53. 
Ariane Burgess's amendments seek to enable or require ministers to take action to safeguard the interests of temporary migrant worker workers. However, the amendments cover not only workers in agriculture, but all migrant workers. Now, I agree that it is important that workers in agriculture, indeed all workers, are treated fairly. This government is committed to fair work, and we are doing what we can to promote that. The powers in the bill enable ministers to provide grant and aid for the purposes set out in Schedule 1, and it is Scottish Government policy as part of our commitment to fair work that grant aid paid under the bill will be subject to fair work conditions. Now, it is a standard condition that all staff aged 16 and over, including apprentices who are directly employed and work in Scotland, the, uh, the grantee are paid at least the real living wage. It is a standard condition that the grantee shall demonstrate that all workers employed within their organisation have access to effective workers' voice ch channels, including agency workers. And the grant can be clawed back if these conditions are breached. Now, we amended the bill at stage two so that ministers must, when preparing a rural support plan, have regard to the desirability of the agricultural sector operating with fair work principles. Now, we have to be careful that we don't stray into territory that is out with our devolved competence, which is why the amendment introduced at stage two was drafted as it was. Now, Ariane Burgess seeks to provide for a new register of employers at stage three of the bill, but that is the kind of reform that needs much more consideration and consultation than has been possible at such a late stage in the process. So, for example, it's not clear whether the proposed register is to be a register of all persons who might employ migrant workers or only of employers of migrant workers who are considered to operate with fair work principles. It's not clear how compliance with any registration requirement would be enforced or even if it can be. And it isn't clear if the register is to be a public register. What is clear, though, is that any requirement to register will impact the privacy of employers. So that's why we should consult with the Information Commissioner before making any such requirements. And that hasn't happened here. Yes. Rachel Hamilton. Um, does the, listening very carefully to Richard Leonard about um, some of the conditions um, that are that migrant workers are living in in caravans. The local authorities have the ability to inspect. Why is the Scottish Government not ensuring that that monitoring compliance is being achieved if the things that Richard Leonard is talking about are true? Cabinet Secretary. I haven't yet turned to Richard Leonard's amendment, but I will hopefully answer that query when we reach that. Uh, sorry, just turning to the amendments that I, I was addressing there and the amendments in the name of Ariane Burgess. As I have said, it is important that workers in agriculture, indeed all workers, get a fair deal. But we need to keep in mind that both employment and immigration are reserved, so there are therefore limits to what we can do and still be within legislative or devolved competence. So for all those reasons, I would strongly urge members not to support these amendments if they are moved. Now, turning to Richard Leonard's amendment, and uh, he has raised a number of very important points, and indeed we met and discussed many of the issues that he'd raised at stage two. Amendment 56 seeks to fill a perceived gap in the duty of agricultural wages inspectors whose role is to ensure the correct observance of the Agricultural Wages Scotland Act 1949, which does not cover accommodation standards. So while I completely understand why Richard Leonard has raised concern about this, unfortunately I can't accept this amendment because it doesn't work, because it provides for the delegation of functions that do not exist. Now, while dealing with routine or complaint inspections, members of the Agricultural Wages Enforcement Team already report on any concerns raised by employees on the condition of their accommodation to the appropriate local authority. This is procedural practice and allows the appropriate authority to deal with housing issues. But what I would say is that the legislation in this area is extremely complex, particularly in connection with mobile homes, caravans and migrant workers. The Government is committed to working with all parties and it would therefore be more suitable for any potential changes to be considered in the round because this affects more than just agricultural workers. The Scottish Government is aiming to publish a public consultation for our new cross-tenure housing standard in 2025 and it's anticipated that the consultation will include consideration of a new standard for all homes, new or existing, including agricultural properties, mobile homes and tied accommodation. Yes, I am. Richard Leonard. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for taking an intervention. But what is her answer to my question at the end of my contribution, which is what's going to happen this year when people arrive uh, and the government uh, is proud of its record on immigration and encouraging immigration, which I support, but we need to treat people properly when they arrive. And it's obvious from the evidence that we've seen that that's not happening. So we can't wait until 2026 or 2027. What's happening next week? What's happening next month? 
Cabinet Secretary. I absolutely appreciate the points that Richard Leonard has made, but there is no getting around the fact that, as I have already outlined, this is a very complex area. As well as meeting with the member directly, I also met with the Workers' Support Centre and hearing from some of the issues that, that they are experiencing, that they are seeing on the ground directly. This cuts across a number of different areas, and unfortunately, I can't wave a magic wand and make all those issues uh, immediately disappear. But that's why I was going to offer Richard Leonard, I want to make sure that we continue this work and offer him a meeting with both myself and the Minister for Housing, Paul McLennan, so that we can really start to get to grips with some of these issues and address them, because they are hugely important. But given the nature of what I've talked about, the fact that it cuts across different areas and is so complex, I would ask the member, I hope he will take me up on that offer of a meeting, uh, to see what, how we can take this forward. But I would urge him not to press his amendment today. Thank you. And I call Ariane Burgess to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 44. Seasonal workers who labour on our farms in, are inherently vulnerable. They are not in the UK for long enough to earn rights against unfair dismissal. And many do not speak any English. And they come from countries where it can be dangerous to speak up to authority. They are not represented by unions or directly by MSPs. But we still have a responsibility to care about them when they are working in Scotland. There have been a, re a relatively small number of incidents of unfair treatment of seasonal workers on Scottish farms, but recently there have been four serious breaches of the agricultural wages order, which was found by the Workers' Support Centre. Even one case of seasonal worker mistreatment or exploitation is one too many. We cannot build a Scotland's agricultural success on the mistreatment of others who are doing key work to put food on our tables. But I have listened carefully to the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comments on my amendments around, the, uh, around a number of issues, um, including the need for more consultation and consideration to delve more into the detail. Uh, to get more understanding on compliance, uh, is the register going to be public, and also the need to consult with the information commissioner. I also uh, understand, and, and also through our conversations in the lead-up to uh, stage three, that uh, some of this could become complicated with reserved matters. So I am seeking to withdraw Amendment uh, 44. Uh, and all the other amendments that I've put forward in this, and I look forward to constructive collaboration with the Cabinet Secretary in the future on this very important issue. Thank you. Ariane Burgess seeks to withdraw Amendment 44. Does any member object? No member objects, and Amendment 44 is withdrawn. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 44. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 41. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 44. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 48 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 41. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, two seconds, presiding officer. Um, yeah, moved. Sorry. Uh, we, sorry, Amendment 40, we've... We... Um, amendment 48. 48? Yes. You... Sorry, uh, Presiding Officer, yeah, I decided not to move that amendment because I'd uh, uh, had assurances from the Cabinet Secretary. I'm sorry. Thank you. Amendment 48 is not moved. I call Amendment 49 in the name of Richard Leonard, already debated with Amendment 41. Richard Leonard, to move or not move? The question is that Amendment 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. I call Jenny Minto for a point of order. Apologies, my phone didn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you. Ms Minto will ensure that that is recorded. I call Gillian Martin for a point of order. Exactly the same issue. Um, I would have voted yes. Thank you. Ms Martin will ensure that is recorded too. The result of the vote on amendment number 49 in the name of Richard Leonard is yes, 86, no, 26. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 2, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. Thank you. The question is that amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and we move on to group 8. Code of Practice on Sustainable and Regenerative Agriculture. I call Amendment 50 in the name of Edward Mountain in a group on its own. I call Edward Mountain to speak to and move Amendment 50. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And this is really just a simple amendment uh, to try and get to the bottom of what sustainable and regenerative agriculture means. It was actually driven home to me this morning, I guess, when we heard on uh, the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee a call for that term which is being used in relation to land reform to be explained. Now, I have been farming for 40 years. I think I know what is sustainable and regenerative, um, but I don't know what it is in law. So I'm calling on the government to, to lay out that within a year of this section coming into force, to explain it to humble people like me, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. For a simple amendment, I have quite a simple response, just to say that I am content that the code should be published in a timely manner, so that our farmers and crofters can use it to best effect in undertaking their activities in a manner which is sustainable and regenerative. And I think that this amendment provides that certainty of publication within a set time frame. So I would urge members to support it. Thank you. Edward Mountain to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 50. Um, I have nothing to add to what the uh, words of the Cabinet Secretary, which are incredibly wise in this situation, and I move the amendment. Thank you. Well, the, que the question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we move to Group 9, Continuing Professional Development. And I call Amendment 3 in the name of Beatrice Wishart, grouped with Amendments 13, 4, 51, 52 and 14. Beatrice Wishart to move Amendment 3 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will speak uh, to the amendments in my name. Amendment 3 would ensure that peer-to-peer -peer learning is a form of continuous professional development covered by the Bill. The importance of this type of learning in the agriculture sector was highlighted on several occasions to the committee, including at our fact-finding farm visits. I believe there would be merit in clearly laying out on the face of the bill that this kind of learning is supported. I thank Edward Mountain for his support of my amendment, and I acknowledge his similar amendment at stage two. Amendment 4 in my name creates provision for continuous professional development to be fair and proportionate by considering the number of employees, the scale of agricultural activity and the geographical location of the farm, croft or land. The intention behind this amendment is to ensure that CPD is accessible to all farmers and crofters, regardless of the size and location of their farm or croft. I would appreciate any assurance the Cabinet Secretary can provide that the Scottish Government will be ensuring this is in the design of CPD. Amendment 52 requires Scottish Ministers to consult such persons as they consider appropriate before making CPD regulations. CPD must be co-designed with farmers and crofters to ensure it is effective in achieving its aims. This amendment would ensure that there is a statutory requirement for farmers, crofters and land managers to have their views on continuous professional development considered by Scottish ministers before making regulations. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen to speak to Amendment 13 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Amendment 13 would insert uh, a new paragraph into Section 27.3. Uh, that paragraph would add a new matter to that Section 27.3 list, uh, being circumstances in which a person who would otherwise um, uh, be required to undertake a particular CPD or a particular amount of CPD does not require to do so. The amendment requires that there may be particular circumstances in which persons who are required to undertake compulsory CPD are justifiably not able to, for various reasons, such as illness or other reasonable circumstances, and I would ask Parliament to uh, support that amendment. Thank you. And I call Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 51 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a replication of my Stage 2 amendment, which fell in error and I won't clip on anyone as to the circumstances, but um, CP CPD uh, should be inclusive and attainable. Amendment 51 in my name specifies that CPD must be affordable and accessible for those receiving the training. This ensures that CPD requirements do not create an excessive financial burden for those receiving the training. And turning to the other amendments in this group that I wish to speak to, I would like to highlight my strong support for Amendment 3 in the name of Beatrice Wishart, uh, also supported by my colleague Edward Mountain, which acknowledges the value of peer, -to peer learning. I recently attended Scott Sheep across at Aikengol near Dunbar, and I spoke to the uh, mental health support charity, Farmer Strong, and they were very um, strongly of the opinion that farmers are much more comfortable when speaking with like-minded peers. And I think this is one of the most significant amendments in the bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Emma Harper to speak to Amendment 14 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to move Amendment 14 in my name. There's uh, quite a, a few subsections to it, uh, but I'd like to highlight that the National Farmers Union in Scotland supports this Group 9 CPD amendment. I have a particular interest in parts of the bill that relate to continuing professional development. I was a clinical nurse educator in my previous role with NHS and Friesland Galloway, and I was embedded in education and CPD for 30 years as a registered nurse. And during those 30 years, I witnessed and experienced the value of ongoing education and CPD. I'm also acutely aware of the value of CPD for agriculture, having visited Scotland's Rural College in Defries and Galloway on a number of occasions and the SRUC Edinburgh campus also. I have met the SRUC team on many occasions and have heard from the exceptional experts that provide education for our current and future farmers about how education, research and CPD is crucial for agricultural, forestry and rural skills development and skills enhancement. I have lodged Amendment 14 and thank everyone who assisted with this to make it clear in the Bill that continuing professional development activities need to be made available in a range of formats, including peer-to-peer -peer CPD, which which committees colleagues highlighted at stage two in their contributions. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is the language used in Beatrice Wishart's amendment number three, so I tend to agree with that. My amendment helps to demonstrate that there is no requirement for farmers, crofters, land managers and other agricultural producers to attend off-farm or away from their business education to have their CPD. With CPD, a person who is working in agricultural production could obtain knowledge or improve their, their knowledge about the best techniques, innovations and skills in a range of ways to meet their individual needs. This could mean peer support as well as completing online learning, which is similar to how healthcare staff achieve much of their required continuing professional development. And it works. NFU Scotland has highlighted that CPD could be obtained by engaging with professional organisations, and an example they used was the Soil Association. Amendment 14 therefore inserts a new section after Section 27, requiring ministers to monitor to the impact of the CPD schemes made under Section 27 and report on their impact and effectiveness with particular regard to the findings of that monitoring and also the matter set out in subsection 2. Those matters reflect particular points that were raised at stage 2 which relate in terms to range, format and type of access and ensures that ministers are required to access how future CPD schemes deliver against these issues, meaning that CPD can be delivered optimally. 
finally, subsection 5 will also require ministers to lay any such reports before the Scottish Parliament and also to publish them. Subsections 3 and 4 respectively give ministers discretion as to the manner and period or periods for monitoring and discretion as to the number and frequency of reports. Subsection 6 additionally includes a new enabling power to allow ministers to modify the regulations by regulation the matters set out in subsection 2, subject to the affirmative procedure under subsection 7. Taken together, subsections 3, 4 and 6 will give ministers an appropriate degree of flexibility to ensure this monitoring and reporting is undertaken as effectively as possible in respect of future CPD schemes. So, In closing, this amendment will ensure that the focus of such monitoring and reporting will remain relevant and can be tailored so as to ensure that its dis delivery can be as effective as possible. So I hope the government and colleagues can support this amendment number 14. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'm rising to speak in support of Beatrice Wichart's excellent amendment, which I recognise from stage two, which I proposed uh, at that stage, but unfortunately he didn't get through. Now, the reasons why I was keen for peer-to-peer learning is I think that's where farmers come into their own because not only do they learn from farmers in the locality what's going on but some of the tricks that they have to get round the problems that they encounter which for example can be just uh, feeding more iodine in, in your mineral licks which allows an easier carving. That's something that you get from experience on the ground and was certainly brought out by some of the groups were which were run by uh, the SAC, like the suckler cow groups uh, across uh, Murray, for example, where I found them particularly useful. But there is another reason why I think peer-to-peer -peer learning is so important, because it allows you to see your neighbour at very busy times when they may be struggling with some of the problems that they're having to face. No one knows what it's like, unless you've actually done it, to have a tricky calving or a tricky lambing where you lose a substantial number of calves or lamb, despite all your hard work. And therefore, having a period to reflect on that with your peers in a peer-to-peer -peer learning group is, to me, incredibly important. Not only does it teach you things, it also gives people a chance uh, to assess their neighbours' mental health if they are struggling, because it does happen. I like Beatrice uh, Wishart's other amendment about co-design uh, and the number of employees. And obviously, uh, Rachel Hamilton's amendment about making sure that uh, CPD is affordable is absolutely critical. And I think monitoring these schemes is really important, especially if peer-to-peer -peer learning is in some ways funded not only by the private sector, but also by the government. And the government will want to make sure their money's well spent. So I hope that this uh, chamber will get Beatrice Wichart's uh, amendment through on peer-to-peer -peer learning, which I wholeheartedly support having it raised in, in the first place. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And just to say from the outset, uh, Scottish Ministers recognise the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think for all the reasons that have been set out by Beatrice Wisher, and importantly from Edward Mountain uh, as well, and recognise its value to farmers and crofters. So I would uh, encourage Parliament to support that amendment. Turning to Amendment 14, this introduces a monitoring and evaluation requirement covering important matters relating to accessibility, appropriateness and proportionality. And these matters reflect those that were raised in the amendments lodged at stage two, and I agree that they are of key importance. The flexibility that is built into this amendment on manner and period of monitoring and the number and frequency of reports to be prepared, the timescales for the monitoring to take place and the matters that this must focus on, I think will also allow monitoring and evaluation to be tailored to really ensure that its delivery can be as effective as possible over time, and also ensuring that ministers share their assessment on the effectiveness of the CPD schemes that they have developed and implemented. So I would ask the Parliament to support that amendment. Turning to Amendment 4, we fully intend to create a CPD regime that supports and empowers the individual to perform at their best without being unfair or unduly burdensome. So, while I agree with the intent of Beatrice Wishart's Amendment 4, which is absolutely right, I believe that Amendments 14 and 52, in the names of Emma Harper and Beatrice Wishart respectively, will more effectively address the issues that Amendment 4 appears to be concerned with. And it will allow those issues to be considered from the outset in future CPD design and ensure 
ensure that the impact and effectiveness on the areas of accessibility, appropriateness and proportionality is kept under review and adjusted as required. Turning to uh, Amendment 51, as Rachel Hamilton has already outlined, it is the same as uh, an amendment that was lodged at Stage 2. Now, while I absolutely agree that CPD needs to be accessible, and in that includes in terms of cost to users, this matter is already addressed by Amendment 14 on monitoring and evaluation, which will require monitoring and reporting on, amongst other matters, the costs that are associated with CPD activities. And additionally, Amendment 52 would introduce a statutory duty to consult on regulations, which would then consider these matters. But I also have to emphasise that it is the, the drafting of Amendment 51 which is significantly problematic, because just like Amendment 4, Amendment 51 would create a legal duty on ministers every single time they use the power under Section 27.1 to ensure that CPD activities are affordable and accessible for those receiving them. So to begin with, affordable and accessible are undefined, they are unclear and subjective, and it is not clear how it would be reasonable and practically possible to comply with that. And further, uh, furthermore, ministers will need to be able to use the power to make regulations on CPD that would not remotely touch on or impact issues of affordability or accessibility of CPD activities in any way. So that would include, for example, regulations that we could make about certification of CPD providers, CPD recording, monitoring and enforcement, and information processing, or even minor technical amending regulations. So the duty in this amendment will apply to every use of Section 27.1. So where regulations would concern these matters and not relate to CPD activities, it just wouldn't be possible for ministers to comply with this duty, thereby rendering it impossible to use the power. And it goes without saying that this would cause major problems in establishing and managing future CPD regimes. And in fairness, I don't think that would have been what Rachel Hamilton intended. I think it should also be noted, though, that ministers will separately have the power to provide financial support for accessing, developing and providing CPD under Section 4 and Schedule 1, paragraph 81A. Matters of affordability and accessibility would also be considered as a part and parcel of ABRIA and other impact assessments that are linked to the introduction of secondary legislation where appropriate. So I would, with all of that, I would therefore ask Rachel Hamilton not to press her amendment. In relation to Amendment 13, this recognises that there may be particular circumstances in which persons who are required to undertake CPD are justifiably not able to do so for various reasons, such as illness or other reasonable circumstances. So I would ask the Parliament to support that uh, amendment. And on Amendment 52, which introduces a consultation requirement when using the Section 27.1 CPD enabling power, ministers have already informed stakeholders that they will co-design the CPD regime with them. And as I've already outlined, Outlined, informal consultations have already taken place, with further planned later this year and a former consulta consultation next year. But nevertheless, I appreciate that this amendment will provide reassurance that the views of stakeholders in development of this regime will be sought, and accordingly I would ask the Parliament to support that amendment. Thank you. And I call Beatrice Wishart to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 3. Thank you. Presiding officer, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her views on my amendments and I'm satisfied with her explanation <coughs> that, excuse me, that CPD will be designed in such a way as to ensure it is accessible to farmers and crofters regardless of the size and location of their farmer croft. And so I won't press Amendment 4 when we reach that. Uh, for reasons uh, that I and others have already stated, I believe it is important to specify peer-to-peer -peer learning on the face of the bill, and so I move Amendment 3 in my name. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 3. Alistair Allen to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Beatrice Wishart, already debated with Amendment 3. Beatrice Wishart to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 51 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 3. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
I call Shona Robertson for a oh. My apologies, just do give me one, one moment, thank you. The vote is closed. I call Shona Robertson. Sorry, I couldn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Robertson. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Shirley Ann Somerville for a point of order. Thank you, President Officer. I also couldn't connect and I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Somerville. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 51 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 48, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 52 in the name of Beatrice Wishart, already debated with amendment 3. Beatrice Wishart to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Emma Harper, already debated with Amendment 3. Emma Harper to move or not move? Move, President Officer. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I call Amendment 53 in the name of Ariane Burgess, already debated with Amendment 44. Ariane Burgess to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. That amendment is not moved. And before we move on to Group 10, I'm going to suspend for a short five-minute break. And the division bell will ring when we're about to resume. Thank you. <laughs> 